Welcome to Fresh from the Old Bailey. This is a special season about the Constance Martin trial. Every week, for the length of the trial, we're going to be joined by two of Court News' reporters from inside the Central Criminal Court. The basics of the case. In January of last year, 35-year-old Constance Martin and her boyfriend, Mark Gordon, then 48, led the British authorities on a merry dance that briefly became the centre of a national conversation. Martin was an aristocrat whose father had been a page to the Queen Elizabeth. They abandoned their flaming car by a motorway in Bolton, travelled to Liverpool, turned up in Harwich, the Essex ferry port, were spotted in nearby Colchester, then in London, and finally in Brighton. The reason for the urgency of the hunt was that, in the back of that burnt-out car in Bolton, police had found a placenta, and by the time the pair were arrested, two months later, the newborn baby they'd been so desperately hiding from the authorities was dead. One year on, for a week now, Martin and Gordon have been on trial in Court 5, a few yards from where we're now sat. Beneath them, in the press gallery, have been the court news staffers, company co-owner Guy Toyne, Hello. And reporter Jack Hudson. Hello. Jack, you've been in court pretty much every day, haven't you? Yeah, I've attended every day of the trial since it opened last Thursday. And has that been exhausting for you? Um, it's nice to be in one trial and not be running around the building doing lots of different ones. So we've had Gordon in the dock throughout, and we've had Martin in the dock only on Wednesday this week. That was the first time she appeared. Before that, she was not in court. The jury were told that she was not there, that a link was available for her, and she may appear, but she didn't. So the first time the jury's seen Martin was this week. Do we know anything about why she didn't appear? We don't. Um, We know that she was in conferences with her solicitors during some of that time. Her barrister has actually also not been in court Um, because he's still doing another trial in Chichester. So she's only been represented by her junior at the moment. Um, So she was in conferences with her barristers for some of that time. And, but yeah, she came to court on Wednesday. What do they look like in the the dock? How do they behave? It's interesting. They are very chatty throughout the trial throughout the jury hearing evidence on Wednesday. They were talking to each other. They sent quite a lot of notes. I think Martin sent five notes to her barrister during proceedings. Um, They've got, both got a huge stack of notes and papers on them. So they seem very engaged. And um, yeah. They were happy to see each other. They gave each other a hug. Um, But Constance Martin's mother, who was sat at the side of court, Constance didn't appear to look at her at all throughout the day. That's interesting. So you say, in your opinion, they're they're still a couple? They definitely still seem to be a couple. They... So Martin was brought into the dock first. Gordon arrived. He walked over. He sat right next to her. He asked if she was okay. They were then asked to move by the dock officer and asked to sit apart. Um, but when they could, during the mid-morning break, they had a hug. And, yeah, they seem like they're still a couple. Mm-hmm. This case centres on the death of a baby, but what are they actually charged with? They are charged with manslaughter. That's manslaughter by gross negligence. So causing their baby's death by negligent behaviour. They are charged with child cruelty. They are charged with causing or allowing the death of a child, perverting the course of justice by hiding the baby's body in a shed. So just take us through what you've seen over the past week or so. The, the case opened and how did it open? Yeah, so the case was opened last, well, we were expecting an opening last Wednesday, which didn't happen. So there's about 30 journalists in court who were all very disappointed. Um, but the case opened on Thursday. So prosecutor Tom Little outlined the facts, went through, told the jury about the evidence they're going to hear. Um, he said that the baby's death was caused by the cruel, callous and arrogant behaviour of the defendants. 
Uh, he concluded his opening the next day, and then we had an introduction from Gordon's barrister, who outlined the defence case. And then, since then, we've had basically a selection of members of the public, so people who got involved in that hunt for the couple, who saw them. Some of them knew that it was them, they'd seen them on the news. Some of them didn't know it was them, but they later realised. Let's just dive straight into that, because these are quite fascinating accounts you know, there was a sort of a national campaign of awareness. Have you seen these two? I think a lot of people felt that they'd seen those two somewhere, uh, but some people actually did. Uh, and what they saw was, I don't know, it was quite strange and disturbing at times, wasn't it? We've seen CCTV, several clips of CCTV of the couple actually on the run, as it were. Um, it's been, some of the material has been quite bizarre. Uh, Constance Martin was obviously trying to keep the child warm under her coat because it was the middle of winter and bitterly cold. And she'd stuffed the coat with the innards of some old furniture. So she's sort of waddling around, looking a little bit like the Michelin man with the baby uh, underneath the coat. And there's a scene in the street where the baby, she's actually trying to sort of comfort the baby, it appears. And the baby comes out from the coat and it's, it's, it's quite a strange scene. We've seen a number of pieces of CCTV like this. We've also seen the couple um, when they were in a kebab house uh, looking after the child there, putting the child in the pram. And you see uh, Gordon putting some sort of blanket across the baby as well. So we have seen quite a bit of the CCTV. We've also seen the car that they were in um, exploding on the M61, uh, the car in flames. And there's been some quite graphic evidence about passers-by telling them to get away from the car as it actually goes up in flames. It has been really some quite bizarre uh, evidence that we've heard about these two and how they were living in a in a blue tent and passers-by seeing them coming out in the freezing cold. It's it's all, all been very, very strange. Of course, the prosecution case is that having had four children taken away from them by social services, they were absolutely determined that this one was going to stay with them whatever it took. And therefore, the arrogance, the level of arrogance the prosecution are talking about is the level of arrogance which, saying, which says that they somehow knew better than social services. And because of that, uh, baby Victoria paid with her life. But the case of the couple, of course, is that they did their very, very best for the child. And Martin has said in, to the police that basically she woke up one morning and the child was dead. So this is the matter, this is the case that the jury will have to decide, was whether the couple were really trying to give the very best level of care they could do for the child, or whether it was they were grossly negligent. In the middle of winter, a baby of that age, living on the run, living in a tent, it's, it's quite strange. The other thing that's quite strange about the case, of course, is the money, amount of money that they are able to spend on taxes, which is absolutely astonishing. The court has heard that Martin had access to a trust fund, and some of the money from this trust fund went on them traveling up and down the country in taxes. I believe one taxi fare was around £400. It's absolutely astonishing. I mean, most of us balk at the thought of paying, you know, £10 for an Uber. Uh, not so Constance Martin and Mark Gordon. But as you can imagine, a lot of the money had to be paid up front because uh, I suppose living rough as they were, they were of a, how can I say, slightly dishevelled appearance, especially with the uh, furniture stuffing leaking from Martin's coat. And so that's been been quite strange, I think. It's... it's uh, They've, they lived a very, very strange existence, very hand-to-mouth, you know, huge taxi fares, 
Donner kebabs at the German Donner kebab house. It's all been quite bizarre. As they've been riding across the country in these taxi cabs, obviously uh, over the course of a four-hour journey, they've been speaking to the, to the drivers, haven't they? One interesting thing we have learned about Constance Martin is she appears to be a woman of many faces because um, when she gave birth to her first child, uh, she pretended she was a gypsy uh, called Isabella O'Brien um, and even faked a Irish accent. Uh, this was apparently in the hope that she would get easier access to social housing uh, if she was, you know, an, an itinerant traveller. Uh, whether or not that's the case or not, we could only speculate. But then when she was in the taxi, another taxi, she had the scarf pulled up over her face. And now what you will see in the CCTV is there's a lot of evidence of these two trying to prevent themselves being identified on CCTV, either looking away from the cameras, having some sort of mask on, or in Martin's case, pulling a scarf up over her face. And when she was in the back of one cab, the driver turned to her and said, are you a Muslim? And she said she was. Um, or perhaps I suppose she could be. Um, the driver then asked her whether she had read the Quran, and uh, she said, indeed, she had. So I suppose both these things could be true. However, I don't think that she is uh, the uh, gypsy woman called Isabella O'Brien that she made out to be, and I think uh, she accepts that is the case. She's had four previous children. Has, has there been any evidence on that? Yes, so we've had, she met Gordon in 2016 and they've had five children in quite quick succession. So she's given birth to the first child, pretending to be an Irish traveller, which obviously prompted some concern from the hospital. Social services got involved. They found that at that stage, Martin and Gordon were living in a tent. Even then, the tent was visited. Social services officers decided that wasn't an appropriate place for a baby to live. Martin was placed into a foster care placement as a mother and daughter. There were some concerns raised then that she was sleeping with the baby in her bed, which has become relevant because Martin's case is that the baby died in the tent while she was co-sleeping with the baby. The prosecution say even on her case, she would still be guilty because... She'd been warned before about the dangers of co-sleeping with a baby. Um, we don't know as much about the births of the other children, but we do know that one of the children, after it was born in the hospital, Martin discharged herself from hospital. Her and Gordon left the hospital without the baby. And the next day they came back for the baby. Um, and eventually an order was made that they were not suitable parents and their children were taken into care. Extraordinary. Uh, Constance Martin certainly cuts a figure. I mean, she's often described in the press as an aristocrat. What do you, or, or what has the court heard so far about her background? We've heard that she's a wealthy woman. We've heard that she was in receipt of trust fund payments that she received £19,000 from a trust fund while she was on the run. Uh, her mother, Virginia de Sales, has been in court along with her brother, Tobias Martin. Um, they're both quite impressive figures. She was certainly wealthy and it's certainly been the case made that they had access to money. When you say they're impressive figures, what do you mean by that? I suppose I mean they're posh. <laughs> um, I think <clears throat> they've been quite stoic. They haven't shown much reaction. I think the only time we did see a reaction from the brother was when it was mentioned that Constance Martin had been into German, German Donner Kebab, where he seemed to put his head in his hands at the thought of his sister going into the kebab <laughs> shop. Um, but other than that, they've remained quiet. Oh dear, well it is meant to be the posh takeaway, isn't it? 
And what about Mark Gordon? Uh, is there anything we know about, about his background? Has anyone been to support him in the gallery or such? We don't think so. Um, the public gallery, gallery has been quite full. We don't know who everyone is in there. Um, but there's no family. So Constance Martin's family allowed to sit in the well of the court with the press and others. And we know there's no family for Gordon sat in the well of the court. There may be someone in the public gallery who knows him. We don't know. Um, in terms of his background, we've heard a lot less. Um, it seems to be it was Martin who had access to money. And we just know that Gordon met her in 2016. They started a relationship. They seem to start living They does seem to have a stable, had a stable address. So they were living in tents, Airbnbs, temporary flats. And yet she had access to quite a lot of money. And she was just re retrieving this money from, from ATMs. Uh, even when they were on the run, it seems that they had access to funds. How was that possible? The trust fund put money into her bank account while they were on the run. Um, we don't know why that happened, but that's what happened. Well, that is interesting. I mean, I suppose it's, my theory is that it's, you know, it's quite a common dilemma. Do you help these two people who have a vulnerable baby or do you uh, cut them loose and, and hope that they, they surface? Um, so. We've heard a bit about the prosecution's case, uh, and I guess we've heard a little echo of what the defense case is, that she accidentally uh, smothered the baby overnight. Is, is that the, what's emerging from what the defense is saying so far? We think so. So all we've heard in terms of defense is we've heard Martin gave a pretty full account to police. So her first interview said no comment, but once the baby's body was found. She gave a full account. She disputes when the baby died. So she says the baby died a lot earlier than the prosecution is saying. She's saying it was only living in a tent for about two days. She says on the second night, she fell asleep with the baby in her arms. She, she and Gordon woke up and the baby was dead. We don't know what she'll say if she does give evidence in court. We don't know if she will repeat that evidence. Um, and we haven't heard anything from her barristers yet. We've heard from Gordon's barrister, who has said that the baby was beloved. He has said that the prosecution wants to paint a picture that it was living in a tent for months and months, that it was being carried around in a little bag for life. And he said he suggested that the couple were forced to go on the run by the media coverage. And he's also talked a lot about the media coverage when he's been questioning witnesses. So he's, for example, we had one witness who mentioned the little bag for life, which has been reported in the press. And he hadn't mentioned in his original statement that it was a little bag. So he was then questioned on that. It was said that he had read media reports and that that's why he was saying that. He said no that he just shops at Lidl and Morrison's and not Waitrose or Tesco. So that, that was the first supermarket he thought of. But they've suggested that some witnesses' accounts have been... They've suggested that witnesses have seen media coverage and are misremembering some of the details based on what they've seen. That's interesting. I mean, is that... A common tactic. I mean, I guess that's what you do. You just you just attempt to ask the witness over and over again whether they think. Yes, often. So a lot of the evidence that we're hearing at the moment is accepted by the defendants. So they do accept they were on the run. They accept that most of these people saw them, not all of them, but they have disputed some specific aspects um, about the way they were holding the baby about the way they were feeding the baby and some of the things that were said. Um, but yeah, it has been suggested that witnesses are misremembering or that witnesses 
only saw the couple for 20 seconds. Could you be mistaken? Because there was at least one witness who seemed to imply that by the time she saw the baby, the baby was dead. Yes, that was interesting. And the court did hear that she had made a new statement when she arrived in court on the day and said that she thought the baby was dead. It's not something she said to police at the time. Um, and so this was in February when the prosecution say the baby was still alive. So it does actually support the defense case that the baby may have died earlier. But she says she saw the baby. It was very, very pale white. She said she knows that the baby was mixed race, but it appeared very, very white and didn't make any sound. And she said she thinks it was dead. And she said that she didn't want to believe it was dead at the time, which is why she didn't tell police that. But yeah, so on her evidence, she thinks Martin and Gordon were walking through quite a busy park with the dead baby in her arms. Talk me through some of the cast here, because we've got, I think you, you said to me earlier, we've got Britain's top prosecutor in the prosecution chair, and the, the judge is, is quite an eminent figure too. Yes, so we've got the top judge at the Old Bailey is trying the case, that's Mark Lucraft KC, the recorder of London. So he's the top criminal judge in the country. We have got both of the prosecution team are newly promoted. So we've got Tom Little KC, who prosecuted Wayne Cousins, for example. He's just been made first senior treasury counsel, which makes him the top prosecutor in the country. It means he does some work assisting the attorney general and the government, and he'll prosecute the biggest cases at the Old Bailey and other courts. Uh, he's assisted by Jill Smith, his junior, but he's a very, a very senior junior because he's just been made a King's Counsel. And yes, defending, we've got John Femioli KC for Gordon and John Ryder KC for Martin, although he is yet to make an appearance. Guy, you've been to court too. When, when did you visit? Yeah, I was interested to have a look at Constance because she actually hasn't been into court. We haven't seen her uh, before Wednesday. And um, she is quite a striking woman, uh, I have to say. She's uh, well made up, not heavily made up, but nicely made up, you might say. Um, she's wearing a long black card cardigan, uh, scarves. Uh, she's got very, very thick hair. Um, it looks as though it hasn't been cut since she's been on the run, but uh, there you go. Um, and it's quite obvious to the jury, I would think, that they are friendly, happy in each other's company. And it does seem that they're very much the couple uh, that they were uh, when they gave uh, or brought to their five children into the world. They've been making quite a lot of notes. Uh, Mark Gordon is very smartly dressed. Um, he's got smart shirt and tie, and he is making a great deal of notes. In fact, it seems as though the pen is always in his hand. Uh, Constance Martin is also making notes, and they are spending an inordinate amount of time chatting with each other um, in fact, it must be quite an ordeal to be the uh, dock officer in this case because they're leaning across him to exchange a little whisper here and a little whisper there uh, throughout the trial. Um, in so many cases, we see defendants who are obviously, how can I say, not exactly happy to be in the uh, same space together. But uh, we don't have that here. As I say, they're very much a couple. Um, and it seems as though uh, their defence to this, or well, these allegations, will certainly be uh, a defence that they both share. So there won't be any case here, I would think, of one accusing the other or one blaming the other. I think it's going to be a very, very much uh, a united front. But obviously, we'll have to wait until we hear them actually give evidence in the witness box 
and I'm sure they both will, uh, to hear uh, what their explanation is and what they have to tell the jury. Give us a little bit of the meta here, because this is a high-profile trial. There are a lot of press in attendance. What is that like when you come down to the Old Bailey and, 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 there's, and there's a trial that is uh, absolutely media febrile? Unfortunately, nowadays, very few members of the press tend to turn up for murder trials. Uh, years ago, of course, it was the case that in every murder trial, there would be two or three reporters there. But the majority of murder trials at the Old Bailey are covered by one or two reporters at the very most. And in this case, there has been a lot of interest. We've had reporters, I would say, from most of the national newspapers here. It's nothing like the feeding frenzy that it used to be years ago. The last really huge trial was that was the case of Maxine, uh, Maxine Carr and Ian Huntley. You'll never see anything like that again. But there's been a lot of reporters here, a lot of reporters doing their pieces to camera outside. Obviously, we've had all the major broadcast uh, organisations here covering the case. So there is a tremendous amount of interest in this trial largely because, of course, uh, of the time that the couple spent on the run. The background to these two defendants is an interesting one. They do make a little bit of an odd couple. Obviously, uh, Constance is a woman of means. Uh, is Mark? Well, we'll find that out uh, a little bit later on uh, in the trial. Uh, but as I say, they're very much a united couple, and it's going to be very, very interesting to hear what they have to say to the jury and uh, what they're explanation for uh, several of their acts, if you will, or uh, how they were going to explain their behaviour away. It, does the court feel like a, like a sort of a red letter day uh, uh, when, on a moment like that, where you have a trial that, that everyone in the building knows is the, is the focal point of, of national attention? No. <laughs> Great. There's a lot of interest uh, throughout the building in this trial. Um, Obviously, those people involved in the case, uh, the judge, Mark Lucraft, is an extremely impressive judge, an extremely impressive man, and uh, a very, very, very good judge. Um, and then we have some of the top barristers uh, in the UK working on this case. Um, I think it's fair to say that the entire Old Bailey is very going to be very interested uh, in the uh, outcome of this case when it comes to an end in a few weeks' time. We're at the end of essentially the first week. What can we expect in week two? How will this develop? We're going to have uh, a few more eyewitnesses. And then we're also, of course, going to have the medical evidence and uh, the autopsy evidence, the, the evidence of the pathologist, who will uh, try and talk us through any potential causes of death and indeed any injuries on the child if there are any. I don't think that is the case here. Um, it's going to be crucial for the jury to try and decide how exactly the baby died. Um, there's not a clear cause of death uh, so far in this case. So they're going to have to decide exactly what were the circumstances that led to Victoria's death. Um, and whether indeed it was due to the negligence of the, of the parents or not, whether indeed it was hypothermia, or whether it was some completely unrelated cause. Of course, these are all possibilities. And as I say, it's a matter for the jury to decide. <laughs> 